just that peace in your heart, knowing that it is well with your soul. And so uh, so that's a tremendous song. I do look forward to getting back in the sanctuary and having live music. And, and I know you sing out a lot more than, uh, than singing by a tape, so I look forward to that. All right, if you turn your Bibles uh, to Psalm 51, and uh, we have been going through the book of Psalms and entitled this Psalms for Life. And... Uh, and certainly the Psalms speak to us about the various experiences that we have in life and speak to the issues of life. And so I pray that uh, you've, as we've gone through some of these Psalms, that they have spoken to your heart. And hopefully, uh, even after we're through with this series, you'll look back and, and uh, allow the Lord to speak to, to you through the various chapters that we've looked at. Uh, tonight... Uh, we're going to begin a new series, and we'll be meeting in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock, and uh, we can spread out. But I'm going to start a new series entitled God the Promise Maker. 
And uh, I really pray that it would be a blessing to your heart as we look at the amazing promises that God has given to us. And these are promises from God himself. And to understand God has given to me these particular promises. Uh, and so there's a really good word for us, not because it's me preaching, but because it's God's word uh, that we need to cling to. Psalm 51, it is a Psalm of David. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. You know, one of the things that I've tried to do over the last few weeks, and maybe some of you have done that also, is to get some cleaning done. Things that maybe you've put off for a long, long time, and Maybe the extra time has allowed you to do some of those things. Uh, I know I've done some power washing and I've done also some uh, clean out gutters and clean some siding and clean out the garage and other projects. And, and you know, there's something about after you clean something, there's a sense of satisfaction, isn't there? I mean, I, I mean, when, after you clean something and while you're cleaning certain things, you didn't realize, man, I didn't realize this had gotten so dirty. And there's a great joy in seeing the cleanliness of what you've done. You ever experienced that? Have you done that? Some of you haven't done any cleaning lately, I can tell you. <laughs> but you know, there's a joy and satisfaction when you've had something for a long time and you finally get out there and you clean it up and, and you say, boy, that just feels good. It sure looks good. Well, not only is that true physically, but it's also true spiritually. We come to Psalm 51, and Psalm 51 stands out in this regards to the seriousness of what I want to share with you today about David's sin. I don't know if you need this chapter or experience this chapter. I know I have from personal experience. And I know God is good and God is forgiving. And, and you know, you don't have to guess the background for this psalm. We're told at the subtitle there, we're told that it's a psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And so it speaks to one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. It has the markings of a modern TV movie. There's luxury, there's lust, there's lying, there's murder. And you can find this episode in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. It's the story, as the Bible says here. It's the story of the account of David's affair with Bathsheba. David had committed a terrible sin, and he tried to cover up his sin. The story goes, if you go back to those chapters in 2 Samuel, you find that David had sort of stayed behind while his men had gone off to war. He walked out on, you know, to his palace one night, and he looked up on the rooftop, and there was a beautiful woman who was bathing there on her rooftop. Well, you find that rather than turning around, David gave in to the temptation and he called her to the palace and he got her pregnant. Then the cover-up began. And you find that through a series of events, David eventually had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed in battle. And then he took her for his wife. For almost a year, David tried to cover up his sin. Finally, one day, Nathan the prophet came in and he preached a sermon to David. And he told about a poor man's lamb who had been stolen by a rich man who was going to provide that for his guests. Well, David reacted instantly to this uh, tale of injustice. And he uh, 
He had sworn that he was simply going to make that man repay the stolen man's land fourfold, and then he was going to kill the rich man. And about that time, what happened? You find that Nathan the prophet stuck his finger in David's face, and he said, Thou art the man. And David was confronted with his sin, and he comes to this point of confession. You need to mark not only chapter 51, but also Psalm 32. Both seem to grow out of the same moral failure in David's life. Someone has written that, that Psalm 51 is more intense, it's more personal. It seems to be written uh, closer to the event, but Psalm 32 is more reflective and it's probably written later and it was more of a teaching psalm. So I want us to look today at what I call David's sin and our sin. I want you to notice three things out of this passage that it speaks to us, I think about. The first thing is this, it reminds us that Christians do sin. You know, we all know that to be true. We know it from experience. We can and we do sin. Christians do sin. John said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, sometimes we can, in a very pious way, look at somebody else's sin and we fail to see our sin. But the reality the, the Bible teaches and life experiences teach us that Christians do sin and Christians do fall. We know from the Bible, we know some of the greatest people of faith fell. There was Noah, there was Moses, Abraham, David, even Peter. The Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So, so David's given a personal testimony to remind us that one can fall in sin. One can sin. So what do you do when you sin? Well, he shares a couple of things here. First of all, you approach the Savior. In verse 1, he cries out, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. And so he appeals to God his loving kindness, and he appeals to God, he pleads for mercy. You know what mercy is, don't you? David was asking for what he did not deserve. He deserved punishment. He'd made some horrible choices. Many people had been affected. But knowing who the Lord is, the Lord desires to forgive our sin. You know, if you're, if you're not a Christian, if you're lost, may I remind you of what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3. He said, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Lord wants to forgive every person of their sin. He wants them to be saved. So what did David do? David approached the Savior. And then what did David also do? He acknowledged the sin. Look in verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Have you ever done that before? Just got before the Lord and said, God, I have sinned. And, 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 and you approach the Savior. As I said, you know, it's so much easier to see someone else's sin and not see it in ourselves. What do we do sometimes when somebody approaches us about our sin? Sometimes we get real defensive about it. Sometimes we try to make excuses for it. Sometimes we try to blame someone else or we try to blame the circumstances. And, but David did what? David acknowledged his sin. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess means to say the same thing. God says this is sin. What do I do? I say, God, I've sinned. And you name that sin. Now notice in chapter 51 and verse 1, notice three different words are used here for David's sin. He talks in verse 1 about my transgressions. You know what transgression means? It means literally to step over the line. And, and, and the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, for sin is the transgression of the law. So God draws a line, and sin is stepping across that line. It's transgressing. That's what sin is. But then he also uses the word iniquities. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities. The word iniquities literally means to twist or distort. And so what does sin do? 
It takes something that God intended to be precious and good and distorts it, twists it from its original intentions there. And so David acknowledges his transgressions, his iniquity, and his sin. The word sin literally means to miss the mark. How many times have we missed the mark? That's what it means. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What God intended for us, we miss the mark. We fail. We sin. And so David is crying out unto God, have mercy upon me. Wash me. Cleanse me from my sin. My sin is ever before me. And you know what David is doing? He's simply saying, it's me, O oh God, standing in the need of a prayer. So he reminds us Christians do sin. The second thing I want you to notice here, he reminds us that Christians suffer because of sin. Can I get an amen to that? We do. You ever had this? I can give a personal testimony to that. We suffer. When we fall, we face consequences. Now, notice what David, I think, brings out to us. What are some of the consequences? He talks about the guilt that it brings. In that year that David was covering up his sin, there was a tremendous guilt that he felt. And, and that's why he's crying out to God, God, I'm at the point of being miserable. Wash me, cleanse me, my sins ever before me. And it's just, it's just like verse after verse, David's guilt is all over him. You see, when God comes into your life, he doesn't change you so you cannot sin again, but he does change the way you feel about your sin. You know, one of the ways that you know that you are a Christian is when you sin, you just don't have a guilty conscience, but you have experienced and will experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's the difference between a lost person and a saved person. The Bible says a lost person is dead in trespasses and sin. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 said, before you were saved, you were dead in trespasses and sin. And so what that simply means is a dead person doesn't feel anything. Yeah, all people have a conscience and a lost person can have a guilty conscience about something. But the difference between a lost person and a saved person is there's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you go to a a hog in a hog pen. A hog is a hog. And that hog is wallowing in the mud. And, and you look at that hog and if that hog could talk and you say, hey, don't you feel dirty there? And that hog would look at you like you're crazy and say, feel, feel dirty. What's there to feel dirty about? He doesn't feel dirty because that's the nature of a hog. But the nature of a Christian is a new nature. And so we feel conviction of the Holy Spirit. And, and so David's talking about the guilt. One well, of the consequences, the guilt that it brings. But he also talks about the control that it demonstrates here. In other words, how does sin affect us as believers? You know, the, the, uh, the devil would have us to say, hey, it's no big deal. I mean... You know, the Bible, that's just a bunch of fuddy-duddy stuff. And, and, uh, but David says differently. He says, my sin is ever before me. Now notice how it affected him. It, it affected his eyes. He said, it's ever before me. It's like, I see that every day. You know, every, everywhere he looked, he saw his sin. And maybe he saw pictures of Uriah dying in battle. Maybe he saw pictures of Bathsheba on, on the rooftop there. But he says, my sin is ever before me. And, uh, and, and, and you know, there, there were times when David would write, the heavens declare the glory of God. There was a time he was writing about, boy, I could see the heavens and they declare the glory of God. But now he says, oh, all I see is my sin that is before me. It affected his eyes. It affected his mind. In verse 6, it says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And, you know, when you sin, when you're involved in sin, you don't think right. Remember the prodigal son? And the prodigal son, his, his thinking ended him up where? In the hog pen. You don't think right. 
He wasn't thinking correctly. How many times people come and, and they, uh, they will say, uh, well, you know, God's just leading me to do this, and it's so contrary to what the Bible says. We don't think right. You see, David's sin might have been out of sight, but it was not out of mind. Now notice verse 10 with me. Notice, he says, it, it affected his eyes, it affected his mind, it affected his heart. Look at verse 10. Created me a clean heart. You know yourself, if you're honest, as a Christian, what does sin do? It zaps the joy out of our hearts. It sucks the gladness out of our hearts. You know, uh, the Lord doesn't want us to live that way. I was just thinking, as I was thinking about this message, the, the chaos that our world is in right now. And do you really think that police officer, when he had his knee up on that man's neck, George Floyd, do you think that man really has joy in his heart? His heart was filled with hatred and bitterness and prejudice. Do you think those people that are going into these stores and looting these stores and stealing and burning those buildings, do you really think they have joy in their heart? You see, God doesn't want us to live that way, but that's what sin does. And, 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 and so, so David's talking about how sin had affected his heart. Sin had affected his spirit. Look at verse 10. And renew a right spirit within me. If you're a Christian, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. When your spirit is not right, sin, sin does something to our spirit. You're harder to get along with. There's an attitude problem. Have you discovered that it's easy to become very critical and fault-finding? You know, I, I've, I've sensed at times when, when it seems like I've become that way, I have to confess, something is wrong in my spirit. Something's wrong in my spirit. You know when your spirit is not right. And David said his sin had affected him in that way. He said his sin had affected his ears. Look at verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Make me to hear. He's talking about how sin had affected his ears. He didn't hear like he used to hear. You know, he'd go hear the choir and thought, well, the choir just doesn't sing as good as they used to sing. He'd go hear Nathan's sermons and, well, Nathan's not preaching as good as he used to preach. You know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, we can become dull of hearing. In other words, when our spirit's not right, the worship songs don't bless us the way they used to bless us. The preaching of God's Word doesn't thrill our hearts the way that it used to when our spirit is not right. David says something else about these consequences, how it just affected everything. In verse 8, he talks about how it even affects your body. That the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. You know, there are some ailments that doctors call psychosomatic. In other words, these are physical ailments that are caused by spiritual problems or emotional problems. And, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, sometimes I can tell if I'm getting sort of stressed out and worried because the back of my neck becomes real, real tight. It affects me physically. And, and, and when my spirit is not right, when my heart is not right, Sometimes it even affects us physically. You know, sin can do a number on you physically. Uh, there was a little joke about a group that went to a nursing home to visit, and they were interviewing this old guy. And they said, how do you account for your longevity? Well, the man, he was pretty frank. He said, well, I drank all the liquor I could drink. I stayed out as late as I could stay out. I ran with women, did all kinds of carousing around. They said, my goodness, how old are you? He said, I'm 24. <laughs> Sin will take a toll on your body. Now I want you to notice something else. It affected his tongue, David is sharing with us here. Verse 14, my tongue shall sing aloud of the, thy righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Somebody as well said, if you aren't walking with Jesus, you won't be talking about Jesus. In other words, if you don't have victory in your heart and life, 
you're not going to be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It affects your witness. I dare say in that one year David was trying to cover up, maybe people in the palace were saying, why doesn't David play the harp like he used to? Why isn't David singing songs like he used to? And I, I read the story of this man who got saved and, and uh, he was really on fire for the Lord. And uh, eventually over the course of time in his church, they even made him a deacon. And, uh, and he was so on fire with the, for the Lord and during the sermons and everything, you'd hear him holler out, amen, amen, amen. And boy, the preacher liked that. But all of a sudden, he didn't do it anymore. Well, come to find out he'd gotten out of fellowship with the Lord. He'd gotten into some sin. And the preacher didn't know that, but he went to him and said, you know, I, I really miss you not saying amen anymore. He said, that really helped me as I preach. You know, when you say uh, amen to a preacher's sermon, it's like saying sick him to a bulldog. And this is what the man said. He said, preacher, it's hard to say sick him to a bulldog when he's got you by the seat of your pants. And doesn't sin do that to us? We don't talk about the Lord. We don't have a desire to sing about the Lord. The old devil comes along and whispers, how can you tell somebody about Jesus? Look at your life. And the devil will do that to us. The point is, Christians do sin. And Christians suffer because of their sin. And the old saying is so true. Sin always takes you further than what you want to go. It will keep you longer than what you want to stay. And it will always cost you more than what you want to pay. But here's the third point. And thank God for this third point. Christians can be forgiven of their sin. Amen? Aren't you glad of that? That we can be forgiven of our sin. When we fall, and even when we face consequences, here's the good news, that we can be forgiven of our sin. In verse 17, David said this, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. And so David talks about the fact that we can be forgiven and we can experience the cleansing that he's talking about. David was so personal about his sin, as I shared earlier. Wash me, cleanse me, and my sin is ever before me. And, and actually, nine times in the first three verses there, he uses personal pronouns. I, me, mine. What that simply says is David faced his sin. He called it what God called it. He said, I acknowledge it. You know, the book of Proverbs says in verse 20, chapter 28, verse 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaken, thou shalt have mercy. And David uses three graphic pictures here of his sin. In verse 1, he pictures sin as a debt. Blot out my transgressions. In other words, wipe my sin off the books. Wipe it out. Cancel my sin debts. And that's what the Lord does. You know, aren't you glad that when the Lord forgives you of your sin, He blots it out? Now folks, thank God for that. He blots out your sin. You know, somebody said this, He doesn't rub it in, but He rubs it out. You know, people may rub your sin in to you, but you know what God does when you confess it and acknowledge it? He rubs it out. He also pictures sin not only as a debt, but also as dirt. He said, wash me. And the picture there is uh, of the women taking the family laundry, the wash down to the river, and they would beat the dirt out of the garments on the rocks along the water. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And then he pictures sin not only as a debt and as dirt, but as a disease. Cleanse me from my sin. And the word cleanse there is a word that was used of lepers. Cleanse me from my sin. And then he says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop. And hyssop was a tender plant that was ideal for a brush. And they would use the hyssop to, uh, to simply apply the blood. Remember the Passover? And as God was going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, and on the Passover night, they were to take the hyssop and they were dip it in blood. And they were to put it on the doorpost there and the death angel would pass over. And any time in the Old Testament there was the mention of hyssop, 
it always involved blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. John said this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That's past sin, present sin, and future sin. Wash me, David said, cleanse me. You see, a stained shirt can't cleanse itself. You can't cleanse yourself. You know what it takes? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I uh, read a cute little story about a little Catholic boy and a little Protestant boy. And they were discussing things like God and the Bible. And, and of course, Catholics pra practice a confession to priests. And they were going back and forth. And the Catholic boy would say, my priest says this. And, the Protestant would say, but my preacher says this, and back and forth. And so the Protestant said, well, you know, uh, you know, talking about the, the situation there, the Catholic boy said, well, my priest knows more than your pastor knows. And the Protestant said, well, he ought to, for you tell him everything. What should we do? When we tell God everything, you know what he does? He cleanses us. He washes us whiter than snow. And because of that, being forgiven of a sin, David made a commitment. Look at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and the sinner shall be converted unto thee. He said, I'm going to use my experience to teach others. You know, there are some folks who think, well, when a Christian sins, you got to put them on the shelf. They need to be disqualified. But David said, God, as you've cleansed me and forgive me, I'll use this experience to teach others. You know, they say experience is the best teacher. Well, you're wise to learn from the experience of others, would you say? And when you learn from the experience of others, it can help you avoid some of those consequences of those difficulties we talked about before. You know, God delights in using broken things. A broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. And so David says, I'll use this experience to tell others about you, your love, your forgiveness. I will sing, he says in verse 14, aloud of your righteousness, and in verse 15, my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Well, in Psalm 32, in verse 5, I said that's a parallel chapter. Listen to what David said in Psalm 32, verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Isn't that a beautiful verse? God forgave me of my sin. God wants to forgive us of our sin. And when we do that, there's the joy of having our sins forgiven. There's the blessings of having the joy of our salvation restored. There's the joy of having our spirit renewed. If God can forgive David, He can forgive you and me. Amen? God can forgive me. Believe me, the things I've done, He can forgive you. And so this morning, as we look at this great, great psalm, I pray this morning, as David said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. He didn't say restore to me my salvation. He said the joy of my salvation. And this morning, first of all, make sure you have salvation. Do you know that you're saved? Has there ever been a time where you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? And if not, acknowledge your lostness. Acknowledge your sin. God, I'm a sinner. Confess that sin. Turn from it. Accept Christ, as the Bible says, by faith. The Bible clearly says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And so today we have to examine our hearts. Is it a relationship issue? Do I have a relationship with the Lord? Or is it a fellowship issue? Maybe it may not be you need salvation. You know you're saved. But maybe today you say, I need the joy of my salvation. Boy, that's a tough one for us as Christians to admit that. But Lord, I don't have the joy of the salvation that I once had. And why do we not have the joy of our salvation? But we have to ask, is there sin in my life? Have I just wandered away from the Lord? And today, if, if you say, I understand what David's talking about. I don't have that joy in my salvation. I know my spirit with God is not right. Well, listen, God wants us to be right. And God wants us to be back in fellowship with Him. So with their heads down and eyes closed this morning. Well, Father, it's so easy for us to look at someone else's sin and not allow you to speak to us about our sin. God, I pray that every one of us would just allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us. And if there be one here who has never trusted you as the Lord and Savior of their life, I pray right now that they would come to understand their lostness or their sinfulness, that sin, the wages of sin is death, eternal hell, separation. Oh God, that they would see that you desire to forgive and you desire to give a relationship. You desire to give life and life everlasting. Lord, we realize it's because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ upon the cross that we can be forgiven, that we can be saved. Lord, I pray for us as Christians. Most of us here today, we testify to the fact that we are saved. I pray that we examine our hearts to see, are we telling others about you? Is our spirit right? Do we have the joy of our salvation? And if not, oh God, help us to be brought to that point, broken and contrite, and renewed and forgiven. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning as we have our hymn of invitation, and you know, David just basically drew a circle around himself and said, God, it's me, it's me, it's me. Wash me, cleanse me, do a work in me. And, and how we need to do that as Christians. And today, there's no shame in it. If you're not saved, Hey, friend, God wants you to be saved, and, and we invite you to do that. Or there's no shame in the fact that as Christians, that, well, I've fallen away, or my joy's not like it once was, and I, I just need to renew my spirit of the Lord today. Lord, the Lord wants us to be forgiven. He wants us to be in fellowship with Him. And so this morning, whatever God would speak to your heart about, we invite you to come. If God's leading you to make the decision to be saved, I know He wants you to be Follow him in believer's baptism. Or sometimes as a Christian, we just need to renew our fellowship with him. Or if God's leading you to join with the church family, we invite you to come. So as Brother Kyle comes to lead us, you come today. We just stand.